Hello and welcome to On Air with UVA. This program highlights UVA's thought leadership and I'm delighted that Lewis Nelson has joined us today. My name is Cindy Frederick and I am the Senior Associate Vice President for Engagement at the University of Virginia. Before we get started with our program, I'd like to highlight a few uh, logistical notes. We are recording today's program and we'll share a link of the recording in a follow-up email in case you want to revisit today's conversation or share it with friends and colleagues. At, this, at any time during the webinar, you may use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to submit questions for Lewis. We will get to as many as possible um, with the time we have after Lewis gives us his presentation. If you have pre-submitted a question when you registered, we already have it, so you don't need to replace that. At this time, I'm happy to introduce Lewis Nelson to you. He is our Vice President, or Vice Provost, excuse me, for Academic Outreach, making him the primary advocate and representative for community engagement, public service, and academic outreach programs across the university. In his role as Vice Provost, Lewis serves as the Chief Advisor to the Executive Vice President and Provost on all academic matters relating to community engagement and public service, as well as overseeing numerous other academic units. In addition to his role as Vice Provost, he is also Professor of Architectural History and is an accomplished scholar, author, and teacher. He is also one of our favorite faculty lecturers with our travel program, Cavalier Travels. Lewis is with us today to discuss an exciting new student-driven program at UVA, Public Service Pathways. Lewis, welcome, and I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Cindy. It's uh, always a delight to partner with you on uh, projects and programs. Uh, and it's, um, it's, it's just a real pleasure to have this opportunity to um, share a little bit about what we're doing with Public Service Pathways with this uh, larger, uh, larger community. So Excellent. with that, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, and, uh, and we'll just jump right in. Um, it's great. So, uh, here we go. okay, great. So, uh, so we have, uh, over the last two years, uh, a team in my office in partnership with Student Affairs and Madison House and a number of other uh, partner units across the university, uh, we have been working on the development of this new program called Public Service Pathways, which we uh, began rolling out this first this year for our current um, and enrolled our first uh, class of the first year students at, at the university. Um, why is that not forwarding? Okay, we'll do it this way. All right. Um, so uh, those of you uh, within the U University of Virginia community that are familiar uh, with the leadership of our president, President Jim Ryan, um, might know that a few years ago, uh, he and other senior leadership put together and published our Great and Good Plan, which is the 2030 plan. Um, and the Public Service Pathways Program was actually written into that uh, Great and Good Plan. And there are a couple of key components of the Great and Good Plan that are, that are built into the Public Service Pathways Program that we have initiated. Um, and I'll read you just a couple of these uh, segments. Our ultimate game for our students is to prepare them to be productive servant leaders, regardless of their careers or professions, that we will define competencies necessary to pursue public service and identify both curricular and co-curricular opportunities for students to meet those competencies. And we will create and coordinate other possibilities to expose our students to a wide range of possibilities uh, in public service. And so uh, with this as our sort of founding vision, uh, we got to work a couple of years ago, uh, beginning to build out of this framework for public service pathways. And we wanted to keep in mind three fundamentals uh, that President Ryan had conveyed to us as we began uh, our, our design project. First is that we wanted the public service pro uh, pathways program not to be a uh, niche an exclusive program, but this is actually something that's supposed to be the yeast in the dough of the entire university. Um, and to that end, we wanted to make sure that we built a program that was optional, but open and accessible to all undergraduate students. And in fact, uh, uh, President Ryan has charged us to consider also after a few years, how might this expand to graduate students across the university as well? Our second is that we want to define public service broadly, and that really gets to a core uh, uh, fundamental commitment uh, that we have, and that is we really want to uh, uh, encourage students to be thinking about a public service mindset, that this is not necessarily vocationally driven, 
Um, and it's not geared to a specific sector, right? This is not just graduating students into the nonprofit world or into um, uh, uh, civil government in some way. Uh, of course, it is inclusive of those, uh, but we really want to make sure that we're graduating students. We think that every student should actually have a public service mindset, no matter what uh, sector they uh, where they land. And lastly, the University of Virginia has all kinds of really fantastic programs already going. And so one of President Ryan's charges to us was that we should curate existing things rather than building out a whole uh, robust suite of new offerings, right? And so our charge here was really to think about how do we grab and coordinate and ultimately curate the extraordinary things that are already happening across the university. So with those key things, uh, three things in mind, uh, we have these um, uh, this tripartite mission that we're thinking about. The first is we really want to focus on mindset, and mindset has as its core uh, presenting to students a series of competencies, which I'll unpack for you in just a moment. We also want to make sure that students experience this program uh, in a community, right? So one of our other charges is that within the various domains that they select, we want to we want to encourage and the, uh, the creation of social communities within those, so that students are meeting students uh, in and around these various communities of interest. And lastly, the point I've already made, we really want to emphasize curation. Um, over creation, right? We want to we want to build as little as possible. We want to build on the extraordinary things that are already happening, uh, so that we're good stewards of our resources. Okay, so beginning in their second year, I'll explain first year in just a second. Uh, but beginning in their second year, after they've completed a first year program, our undergraduate students will have the opportunity to uh, enroll in uh, one or two of our seven different uh, pathways, right? And so it's in their second year that they begin to uh, narrow their areas of interest within public service towards um, any one of these seven particular pathways. And uh, because some students might find themselves at the intersection of two, we're, 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 we're perfectly fine with them enrolling in two pathways simultaneously, and they are these. Uh, public health, global sustainability, security and diplomacy, public art, justice, public interest technology, and education. And we settled in on these seven uh, different domains uh, because about two summers ago, uh, some of our team spent an entire month looking across the entire university for robust uh, offerings that we already had for our students and settled in on these seven different domains. Now, what does this mean actually for a student when uh, they're experiencing this, uh, yeah, when they're experiencing this program? Well, again, beginning in the second year, um, we will send, uh, uh, every student will receive a uh, bi-monthly newsletter. In fact, the students that are enrolled already in their first year are already receiving this bi-monthly newsletter. And this newsletter in their second year will be specific to their particular uh, pathway, right? So, so it'll be justice or uh, public arts. Um, and that newsletter will curate all the various activities that are upcoming over the next two to four weeks uh, that students might want to consider. This will include everything from internship opportunities to uh, major public lecturers that are coming to the university for a particular night, uh, to book groups, to classes they want to consider. It really uh, it aggregates a wide range of opportunities from volunteer opportunities uh, to um, uh, singular lectures to curricular uh, trajectories that they may want to consider. That uh, newsletter uh, will organize the various opportunities that are open to students in three categories, connect, learn and serve. Connect will um, foreground those opportunities where students will have the opportunity to uh, work together or to do something together, to gather together. There'll be a social dimension to that, to connect with other students um, in their around their topical interests. Learn will encourage students that public service is not just about um, a heart of volunteerism, although it absolutely should include that, um, but that actually uh, we need to expand our capacities, our, our, our intellectual capacities as we're thinking about uh, a robust commitment to community well-being and public service. What does that mean? So we want to learn from community experts and from our faculty um, and from our staff about uh, various public service opportunities. And so it will include those as well. And then lastly, we always want to encourage our students to be rolling up their sleeves and thinking about the hard work uh, of public service. And so volunteering, service learning opportunities in the classroom, community engaged courses will all be aggregated uh, under the serve category. And so students will receive all three of those categories. Now, one of the really important differentiating um, factors for our program that we've developed, uh, the Public Service Pathways Program, is that we've read, a, 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 I won't say an ocean of literature, but we've read quite a bit of literature and we've looked at uh, comparable programs at other universities. 
Um, and in doing a bunch of research prior to our launch, we distilled that there are really six key competencies. And you'll remember that uh, President Ryan charged us to really think well uh, about these competencies. And so these are the six competencies that we've settled in, uh, settled on. And we're presenting these competencies to the students uh, just as they arrive. And this is a really important factor. We're putting the students in the driver's seat of their own education. Um, we're not trying to um, sort of behind the scenes um, move students towards a deeper understanding of any one of these. We actually present all six of these competencies to the students right as they enroll in the public service program. Um, and we tell them uh, what we mean by these, and we're encouraging them to uh, think and read more broadly uh, about each one of these uh, competencies. And in their first year, the monthly newsletters, that, the bi-monthly newsletters that they receive focus specifically on their competency development. And um, over the course of their four years, the student's charge is to grow more deeply and reflect more deeply on their personal growth and development in any one or more of these six competencies, because that's actually, um, that's the the graduation, our, our commitment to graduating students that have a mindset of public service really rests on these six competencies. So what are they? Civic identity encourages students to think about uh, the complexities of their own background, right? These are all, um, all of our students are incredibly they're wonderful, complicated um, students coming from all kinds of different uh, contexts. And we want to encourage students to think about those contexts, those backgrounds, the experiences they've had as assets, as resources, that they might be able to bring to uh, to their work in public service and their commitment to community uh, complexity, which is a really wonderful thing. Civic commitment is partnered with that, and that is as a representative or a citizen of a particular community, you have responsibilities. And so if civic identity is thinking about, well, these are the strengths that I have, these are the experiences, these are the differentiating dimensions of my experience and my um, my background uh, that might be helpful or useful in conversations. Civic commitment is thinking about, oh, I need to roll up my sleeves and I need to be prepared for um, engaging in the responsibilities. As a member of a community, as a citizen in a place, I have responsibilities. What are those? Community contexts encourages students to uh, come to uh, understand that communities are very complicated places. <laughs> and that is they are networks and webs of economic forces and social forces, and there's political actors of all sorts. And so engaging in any particular community requires that you step in with uh, some gentleness, um, that you understand yourself as one factor uh, in an already complicated community, and that you can't just swoop in and try to fix one thing right here because something else might pop over there. Right? The idea is to understand that uh, communities are really complicated uh, contexts and that um, it's important for us to understand that complexity uh, before we seek to engage in uh, improving the well-being of any one particular space. Civic communication will naturally, of course, focus on, um, on oral delivery and, and um, uh, public speaking uh, for effective um, advocacy, absolutely. Uh, but it also really focuses on deep listening uh, and making sure that you're building trust through your communication. Uh, ethical reasoning is exactly what it means, and that is we want all students to uh, do the hard work of building out their own ethical framework for understanding um, how they make decisions, uh, uh, how they make ethical decisions for themselves, and that has to be rooted in their own personal values. And so you have to do that hard work of building out an ethical framework. And then collaboration um, reminds students uh, that the good work that we do should always be done in partnership and collaboration with others. Uh, how do you build a competency? So if the student's charge is to build out or strengthen their muscles in any one of these competencies, we're not telling the students exactly what they need to do, right? We um, are giving them the definition of this competency and a little bit of literature behind that if they want to read that. Um, but then they can engage in a whole series of different activities reflecting on their growth in that particular uh, competency. So it, maybe they'll go to a lecture. Uh, maybe they'll join a CIO or a service club um, and expand their capacities and um, uh, understand the depth of experience in any one competency. Maybe they'll practice a competency through a paid internship. There's all kinds of different uh, scenarios or opportunities that we're going to send to students, um, and they'll be reflecting and conveying back to us uh, what that looks like. We've built out a, a dashboard uh, for students, and so uh, in partnership with Student Affairs, who are already rolling out a digital dashboard called Who's Involved, uh, and every student at the University of Virginia will engage in all of their um, university affiliated activities through who's involved. So this is going to be a high trafficked um, uh, platform. Every student will have their own dashboard and at the top of their dashboard will be there if they've enrolled in public service pathways, will be their public service pathways tab. 
And that tab, they can open up and they can see, oh, the same content that um, we're sending them in their newsletter, they can also find right here on uh, their dashboard. And uh, one of the key components is a series of reflected writing papers. And so we're gonna be encouraging students starting in their second year uh, to produce some reflective writing papers. Those will actually be housed here on that dashboard. Um, and so they can go back and read uh, papers that they wrote uh, previously. And we're going to be building out a series of um, a team of faculty and students, that, uh, sorry, faculty and staff, uh, who will be giving students some feedback on those papers, giving them additional things to be thinking about. Um, and then uh, what does the student's experience actually look like? In addition to the various activities that they choose to take on, everything from a whole course to a single lecture, uh, we're also going to be moving them towards these three um, personal develop, personal growth and development frameworks. First is to plan. Um, we're encouraging students to engage with the Career Center uh, very early on so that they can begin thinking about uh, career preparedness and visioning um, as, they're, as they're developing. We also will be developing a series of alumni engagement events. And so beginning in their uh, third year and certainly uh, in their fourth year, we have a framework whereby we're going to um, encourage students to partner with teams of alumni who are have uh, lived expertise in any one of these seven uh, different domains uh, and begin to build out that uh, important mentoring relationship. And so, uh, and that gets to the second piece. We're encouraging students to engage. Um, our first year students will be engaging with upperclassmen uh, in their particular domain. And we're also gonna uh, encourage a lot of peer-to-peer -peer mentoring in that first year. In their second year, we'll be encouraging them to reach out to faculty and going to faculty office hours. Uh, to pursue faculty as part of their uh, web of connectedness, uh, especially as it relates to exploring these new domains. And then in the third year, as I just said, we'll be adding the alumni dimension, right? And so hopefully by their third year, they'll have uh, a peer mentor uh, support network. Uh, they'll have relationships with faculty who are asking them good questions about their personal growth and development as it relates to um, their vocation, but also their commitment to public service. Um, and then in their third year, and um, uh, and in their fourth year, uh, they'll be adding to that uh, connections with alumni. And as I mentioned before, um, uh, progress in this program uh, is rests entirely on their capacity to produce uh, uh, deep and reflective uh, writing papers. So every semester, beginning in their second semester, is their second year, uh, they'll produce a, this reflective writing paper. And their goal here is to say, well, this is the um, competency that I chose to work on. This is the these are the various things that I um, uh, took on uh, that helped me deepen my uh, understanding and my depth of knowledge in this particular capacity in this uh, in this competency or these competencies. Um, and this is my plan for future growth uh, in over the next year. And so these reflective writing papers are retroactive in the sense that they're reflecting back. They're reflective and thinking about the work that they've done. Um, they're reflective on their moment. Uh, this is where I think I am in my growth and development. Uh, and it's also a planning for the future. These are the next activities. These are the kinds of steps I want to take uh, to deepen uh, my growth in that. And of course, every single reflective writing paper will get feedback from a faculty member or from a staff member. And so they'll be able to, uh, those faculty and staff will be able to read uh, also their students' previous papers. Um, this is a program that uh, has taken us a great deal of time to build. Obviously, it took us 18 months before we even rolled it out. Uh, and there are many, many, many par partners from across the university who have been critical to the development of this program. Uh, one of our key uh, partners, of course, is the Alumni Association, the Career Center, uh, Madison House, which is not a University of Virginia entity. Madison House is actually a separate 501c3 uh, sitting adjacent to the university, but is an incredibly important partner uh, because they are uh, the University of Virginia's uh, student uh, volunteer center. Um, and we have been uh, co-producing some really fantastic uh, volunteer support uh, infrastructure uh, in partnership with Madison House. And we're really grateful for um, their commitments to this program. The Office of Citizen Scholar Development, which is the incredible office that sends so many students to win nationally ranked um, uh, fellowships like the Rhodes and many others. Um, the Office of Citizen Scholar Development is helping us think through the reflective writing components, right? They're, ex they're experts. Um, uh, in reflective writing. The Office of the Dean of Students is obviously uh, naturally a, a partner with us, but so is UVA Athletics. UVA Athletics has built out, they're a few years ahead of us in building a really impactful and robust pathways program for their athletes. And so our team spent quite a bit of time talking with uh, our, our 
uh, colleagues over in athletics thinking about student development and what works uh, for UVA students and what has not worked for UVA students. So they saved us a little bit of time and uh, they made a few mistakes for us, which were great. And they were willing to share those with us, which is awesome. Uh, we also have um, partnered with the Karsh Institute of Democracy. This is a really important partnership because uh, Melody Barnes, who's the director um, of the Karsh Institute for Democracy, uh, and I uh, have spent quite a bit of time talking about the um, critical relationship between public service and democracy. Uh, we both believe that a sustainable democracy uh, depends on a citizenship committed to public service, uh, which means that Karsh Institute is uh, very eagerly supporting this particular framework because we actually think that this is central to a healthy democracy. Uh, strategic initiatives is always, uh, always, of course, at the table in the launch of these kinds of major programs. We have what we refer to as our, uh, at least internal to our team, as the Uber Advisory Committee. And this is um, our Uber Advisory Committee. And these are all content experts, folks who have expertise in student uh, development, research expertise in student development, uh, but also years of experience uh, in what works for UVA students and what doesn't work for UVA students. And so partnerships, everything from the president's office, uh, elsewhere across the uh, career center, student advising, total advising, um, Madison House, UVA Athletics, uh, we're all here. And so this team gathers uh, with some regularity to help us make sure that our team stays on track. Um, and we're, um, they've given us some really fantastic advice um, is, as we have been building out this particular, uh, particular framework. Uh, we also have subject matter advisors. As I said at the very beginning, this is deeply uh, connected to our curricular commitments and to the students' curricular experience. Um, many students will complete um, uh, much of their uh, reflective writing around um, their competency development from courses that they've taken. So we want to make sure that we have faculty that are helping us vet what's appropriate for a second year student or what's appropriate for us to put forward in the justice pathway. And so every single one of our seven uh, pathways uh, has a faculty uh, expert subject matter advisory committee, and you'll see two of them here. There were just so many, I didn't want to list all of them. Uh, but you'll see that there are, uh, these are some of the best uh, best minds in the, um, at the university um, uh, who uh, these folks get together a couple times a semester and they're helping us uh, select or identify opportunities for our students that we would, that our small team might not have uh, previously noticed, but also making sure that we're using language that's um, appropriate to the discipline uh, and, uh, and makes sense for, uh, for students as well. Uh, we also, and this is an incredibly important uh, component of our program, we have a student advisory uh, council, our SAC. And so these are the 12 students that have served over the course of this year as our student advisory council. This is a competitive application process, and these are this is a paid position. Uh, and so these students are <clears throat> working on a month-by-month -month basis to help us ensure that the newsletters um, are written in a way that makes sense for students. Uh, they help us make mistake, uh, avoid making mistakes. Uh, in communicating with our students. Um, they're working right now to help us um, uh, meet with uh, candidates for positions that we're hiring. I mean, incredibly, incredibly important um, contributors to this uh, to this program. And I'm uh, forever indebted to David Allen Roth, uh, David Allen Roth, who I'll just name right now, is a PhD student in uh, the education school and has been um, our coordinator for the Student Advisory Council. He's done an incredibly, an incredible job uh, with that. And so I think we're, I'm landing the plane just on time, I think. Um, and so with that, I will stop sharing and we can jump into whatever questions you have. Excellent. Well, Lewis, thank you so much. I learned, I've, you've talked about this program. I've been excited about it, but I learned more um, today and I hope everyone online did as well. I want to start with an easy one, Lewis. Yes. I, uh, and that is about you. You are passionate about this program, and I'm curious, kind of your personal involvement in civic identity, the competencies of the pathways. Tell us a little bit about your involvement in the public sector, the volunteering world, or your engagement in the community. I know you do a lot for our local community. I think uh, our online viewers would love to hear about your not only professional commitment to this program, but just a little insight. Is there a story you can tell us about your personal commitment to public service? <laughs> Thanks for that. That's an unexpected question, but it, uh, that's always the best. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, uh, I'll just I'll mention two if I can. One internal yeah. to my my world of uh, my academic world, and one external. 
Um, uh, so internally, um, I've had the opportunity to make connections with the Andrew Mellon uh, Foundation, and they have been um, increasingly committed to uh, ensuring that we are serving uh, the writing of African American history and uh, supporting African American cultural landscapes. And so I made an application um, whereby I have the great honor of receiving applications from, from uh, teams across uh, the United States where they're applying for funding uh, to document local and important historic African American sites. And it has to be led by an African American organization. And so I just, I, um, that would just be one expression. It's not writing an article. Um, my name's not really on this at all. Um, and uh, what we want to do is lift up the great work that's happening in small corner little communities uh, all across, largely across the American South, uh, but not exclusively. And that just feels really important to me. So um, I'm committed to its supporting uh, community work on the ground in small corners of counties uh, across America, which is which is really great. Uh, here in Charlottesville, I um, I've had the pleasure of of being an advisor to. Um, uh, I'll say, well, gosh, which one to pick? Uh, <laughs> um, I, well, I'll just say this one. I've had uh, the pleasure of serving on a board. Um, there's a great organization in town called New City Counseling, uh, which is a counseling services uh, center, uh, which has uh, done a great deal of work to raise, raise money to support uh, the opportunity for high quality counseling services for our most marginalized and low-income folks in the community. And so I feel really, really strongly about that to make sure that we're providing mental health care uh, for all members of our community. And uh, for those that do not have the financial capacity to uh, come to those kinds of doors, this is a really important kind of service. So I'll just say that. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Well, I think the competencies is a really unique way in, in leveraging things that are existing. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that came in was regarding the reflective writing. Yep. Um, and I was intrigued on that of giving people the opportunity or our students, not only the time to kind of um, to develop their own competencies on a self-directed, but also encouraging that reflective writing. The question that came in online was, is that a requirement? across the board, or is that something that they can choose? You know, you, you showed us that one arc that they can choose their learning experience, but a question came in, is that a requirement or an opt-in? That's a really great question. This is actually where I draw the line in the sand. That's an absolute requirement. Right? <laughs> there, are, uh, We are trying to build as flexible a program as possible. Students can pursue their personal development in lots of different ways. They're in the driver's seat of their own growth and development. I mean, this is UVA, right? Uh, yeah. We have always uh, student self-governance is an incredibly important value that we care care a lot about at UVA. Um, but at the end of the day, um, one can only progress in this program. Uh, you do not graduate to the next year if you do not successfully uh, deliver um, and receive feedback and maybe even respond to that feedback on those reflective writing papers. Um, uh, no, I, I, I think that reflective writing is absolutely fundamental. I think reflection is fundamental. Uh, to this process. We can't understand who we are becoming unless we're taking the time to reflect on that work um, and getting students to, it's essentially journaling, getting them to journal and to reflect on that, and then to be willing to share that uh, with uh, a faculty member or a senior staff member is an important part of their personal growth and development. So it is not an option. Okay, great. It's a requirement. <laughs> it is Relate, related to that is, is this, there was a question regarding academic credit or is this or extracurricular? Does this show up on their transcript in any way? Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, is this just you, um, because our students want to be lifelong learners, they are they're committed to civic, what's the connection to academic credit or any distinction on a diploma? That's really a great question. Um, as, as I said before, we want to build as flexible a program as possible. We have some students, uh, uh, imagine our students in our uh, the engineering school. They have incredibly heavy uh, curricular requirements, and there's not a whole lot of curricular flexibility in the engineering school, and that's all kinds of professional accreditation reasons. We wanted to build a program that even our engineers can do, and so it needs to have um, uh, a great deal of flexibility on that front, which is why we've landed on the reflective writing. That said, as long as students are continuing to demonstrate maturity and progress um, in the program uh, and they complete and they remain engaged uh, and are clearly doing activities all four years, uh, then they will graduate um, as a presidential public service scholar. Thanks for the question, because I had 
failed to include that. Um, let me just add for a little context there. Um, uh, Sydney will know this, but maybe many of our listeners will not. Universities do not like to uh, add things to transcripts. That's right. Uh, we do not like to transcript things. Uh, but this program is so important to President Ryan uh, that he said, nope, we're going to make an exception. Uh, students actually uh, march through and demonstrate that um, growth and maturity over the course of those four years. Um, at the end of those four years, we will graduate them as a presidential public service scholar that will be on their transcript. Awesome. We're very proud of that. Awesome. Thanks for that. Related to that is another question that came in, um, which is regarding the enrollment and yep. the understanding that the enrollment is only open to first years. Is there any accommodation for transfer students? Are folks that come in. So do you have to be here your first year to have the full four-year experience then to be able to get that distinction on your diploma? As soon as that sentence came out of my mouth, I went, oh, that's not exactly right. All right. Well, <laughs> so this is why we this is why we have a conversation. <laughs> that's right. And thanks for these great questions that are yeah, coming. These are great in. questions and super clarifying. So I appreciate them coming in. Uh, keep them coming in. Uh, so we absolutely want this to be as open and accessible to any student um, um, as possible. Uh, at the moment, it's only open to first year students. Uh, but next year, it will be open to first and second year students. And even a student that did not engage in their first year can enroll in their second year. Um, we're not at a place where we're going to probably allow a third year student. We really not want them to do the second year reflective writing um, uh, components. And so a transfer student who's arriving in their second year, no problem. They can enroll. That's easy. We will, however, build out a bridge for a third year student who's arriving. Um, our goal is to say that any student at the university, if you're an enrolled full-time student at the university, we want this program, uh, you, we want you to have access to this program. And so we're not quite at that place yet, but we absolutely will build the bridge for the arriving third-year student. I love that. And I love that terminology, build a bridge. I mm -hmm. think that uh, is, is just wonderful. Alignment. We don't want to exclude any student at the university if they want to pursue this program. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, a lot of questions coming in regarding the reflective writing, and mm -hmm. one of them, are there prompts that you're, and maybe some of our folks are really thinking about their personal uh, commitment to public service. Do you all have prompts um, to give people on these exercises or questions, or yeah. is it 100% uh, free just to reflect on this experience, or the bottom line, the question is, um, thanks for this, is are there prompt questions? Yes, the uh, they're, they're not yet because we're not requiring the reflective writing until the second year, um, but we will be, we're starting that development process in partnership with the Office of Citizen Scholar Development, uh, who are our, our experts in reflective writing. Uh, we'll be doing, uh, we'll be starting that process in about a month and a half, and uh, we'll be developing all of those prompts and a framework for providing evaluation uh, through the course of this summer. So students will receive a prompt, but it will also be clear that we want you to, um, uh, feel free to reach past that prompt. The goal is to process uh, your personal growth and development uh, on the competencies. And if, if one of the prompts doesn't work for you, then just write your own and that's okay. Okay, great. And maybe there's something future we can do on, you know, talking about prompts for us as uh, as uh, lifelong learners on how to do that. That's right. Give me two months and I'll, I'll be an expert on that too. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So talking about access, another question, clarifying question has come in um, regarding students who participate in uh, a semester or study abroad. Yep. Um, will there be an expectation that they continue this uh, process abroad and they should not be penalized for studying abroad, I would guess not. I would I could completely agree. We absolutely want our students to have cross-cultural and international experiences. That's fundamental also to a student personal development. No, the only real requirement is submitting the reflective writing statement, right? And so um, for our students that are that are studying abroad, uh, they can um, uh, uh, they can engage in this through their own coursework, right? And so that so there will be plenty of opportunities for them to con uh, continue that. So being abroad will not uh, hinder your capacity to continue your progress in the program. All right, one last question on the reflection. This is like, where is that? No, I, this is great. I, I wouldn't have expected this and I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. So one of the, uh, you mentioned, I think earlier and the question came in, who will be reading the reflection? So it sounds like that there's gonna be faculty or senior folks that will be reading these and having a conversation or it will be a two-way street. Can you talk about a little bit of how the reflections will be processed and by whom? Yep, yep. So it will be, um, it will be faculty and our senior staff 
uh, they'll be doing this. We're going to do. We're going to uh, build a training mod, not a module in the sense that it's online, but we're going to. Uh, we'll be gathering uh, those faculty and those senior staff for for training, so they'll be trained prior to uh, providing that feedback, um, so that there's some consistency uh, for the student experience. Um, the, uh, the student will receive that, and it may be that the faculty member says, "Boy, I really want you to reflect a little more carefully on this particular dimension of this. Um, can you expand on this and send it back?" Right. And so uh, it may be that the faculty member says, boy, that's brilliant, fabulous, love it, move on. Or it may be that the faculty member says, no, um, this is good, love this, but there's a piece here that I think you might be overlooking. And we'd love you to have the opportunity uh, to do a little bit of a deeper dive on that. So there may, uh, the, the faculty member is invited to initiate a back and forth. Now, one important piece here, because we have uh, the, the um, dashboard, and because all of the students' papers will be processed through the dashboard, um, the faculty members can go back and read previous uh, papers by that same student. And so the, as, the, as the faculty members are providing that written feedback, they can also go back and read previous papers and, and get a sense of that trajectory over time. Excellent, excellent. You mentioned a lot of partners, and mm -hmm. one of them is near dear to my heart for those listeners. I, uh, Before I joined the engagement office, I was the executive director for 14 years at Madison House. And so you <laughs> mentioned, I know it's, it's love Madison House. awesome, <laughs> love it, love it. So my kind of connection to that student uh, self-governance and public service and volunteerism. So you mentioned kind of the partnership you've had with a lot of the uh, uh, organizations, Madison House, CIOs, uh, athletics. Uh, a question has come in, how have local nonprofits or community service uh, agencies been engaged in the process of this new program? So both informally and formally. Informally, I just have lots of relationships, uh, especially through my partnership with the Center for Nonprofit Excellence, which is a major umbrella of nonprofits here in Charlottesville. I have just had, because I've been talking about this for the last two years, uh, my, my friends in the community are getting a little tired of me constantly uh, talking about this, but it, uh, I jest. It's been an important opportunity for me also to, to listen uh, to local leaders. Um, um, and one of the things that I've heard fairly consistently is please do not unleash hordes of undergraduate students to do come public service work um, un unregulated. Um, that's been a really, really consistent theme. And so um, what we've decided to do is not just to have a generic public service uh, or community service um, requirement. Uh, we're encouraging students that they have to do that either through Madison House, um, which provides uh, training and oversight and kind of governance for that. And Madison House has been, um, has amplified its uh, community partnership framework, which has been really helpful as we're developing also our own community partnership framework. And that is, we want to make sure that we're actually doing work that is helping our community partners in really important ways. And that means a requirement for the student to engage for an entire year at Madison House, which is, uh, which is a big ask. Uh, but nonetheless, they still have an enormous footprint with our students. The other way is for them to do that in partnership with a faculty research initiative um, or community te engaged teaching uh, framework. So many of our faculty already have longstanding relationships with the Haven, with um, uh, Loaves and Fishes, I mean, uh, the United Way, lots of different uh, organizations in partnership with faculty. Um, and faculty teach courses in partnership with those community organizations. And so those are the two mechanisms that are we principally encourage students to engage um, with our nonprofit uh, community in Charlottesville. Um, and together also, some, I should, the third really would be our CIOs. We have a number of CIOs who have responsible uh, partnership uh, relationships with community organizations. Excellent. One of the, um, uh, you mentioned a little bit of the diversity of programming. Has there been involvement with the diversity and inclusion team? And what's that connection with the VP's office there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so, you know, becoming aware of the importance of diversity and inclusion as an as a dimension of sustainable uh, and thriving communities is really important uh, to us. So we're thinking about that community complexity uh, core competency, as well as uh, the personal identity uh, competencies, reflection on those. Um, our partners, Ke Kevin McDonald and Rachel Spraker and others in the Vice President's Office for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, have been really important partners. I'm on a, I'm on a meeting with Kevin 
probably weekly <laughs> uh, around, you know, our offices work very, very closely together. Um, in addition to the fact that the descendants, my office works very closely with the descendants community uh, here at the University of Virginia in partnership with Kevin, with the vice president for DEI office. And so our two offices work pretty closely together. Excellent, excellent. Thinking about um, this program is launching, you talked about in the third year, the role of alumni mm -hmm. as mentors or intersection. Now that's a little bit in the future, but right now, if someone, what will be the process? How will alumni find out about how they can become involved, um, knowing that it will be down the road? Yeah, uh, th that's great. I, I'm, I'm very encouraged by the interest uh, to even um, uh, receive that. We, we beginning uh, next year, will have a newsletter that will be a public facing newsletter. We currently we have newsletters that are for our students. Um, but beginning next year, um, probably late summer, we'll start, we'll be developing a, 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 a externally facing uh, newsletter for parents and for alumni, should they uh, want to receive that. So that'll be one component. Uh, but if folks are interested in receiving something a little more, uh, a little more quickly than that, I, I would actually invite you to email directly our office. Um, we'll send an email out. I think we're going to do an email after this program yeah. that'll include some contact there. It'll either be Keisha Jones or Ellen Blackman. Um, and um, our friends who are on this call can simply just send an email there and say, hey, I'd love to uh, receive some information or, or get involved. And we'll um, we'll find a way to follow up. Excellent. Well, I love the idea of a newsletter for parents mm -hmm. and um, alumni. That was one of the questions that came in mm -hmm. um, during the live um, show, the live presentation is that the newsletter sounded really exciting for the students. And is there any way that we can see some of yeah. those no, so, uh, resources? So, <laughs> do the math really quickly, though. We've got seven different domains. Exactly. Um, so it, make so, it the best of. We're doing 14 newsletters. 15 newsletters, because we got the first year as well, 15 newsletters a month. So <laughs> we're doing a lot of communication. I don't think you want all those. <laughs> oh, this is great. Um, two questions have just come in, and I think we have time for just a couple of more questions, and then we're going to close out this um, great session. Um, but here's a question uh, from two of our guests, online guests, is about um, entrepreneurship. And last week was National Entrepreneurship Week. And are there any plans for in the public sector, or do you see um, uh, entrepreneurship uh, going across all the different um, pathways? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so interestingly, I actually approached um, our, our new, fairly newly arrived dean, then newly arrived dean of the uh, Commerce School, um, and uh, asked her if we wanted to have some sort of social entrepreneurship uh, domain. And she actually really strongly pushed back against that and said, no, uh, actually, we want actors in all seven of these domains uh, yeah. to be engaging with folks who have business and commerce experience. Right. Let's not segregate that particular expertise into its own domain, but let's have that engaged more broadly. I loved that answer. Loved, loved that answer. Yeah. Um, and so we fully expect students um, recognizing that entrepreneurship is not just commerce. I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> We've got social entrepreneurship also in Baton and other places around the university. Um, but we absolutely want students uh, who are engaging in entrepreneurship and, and entrepreneurial thinking, uh, new startups, uh, problem solving strategies. Uh, both in communities and uh, more broadly, even online. Um, those are really, really important contributions to a thriving and a healthy democracy and also sustainable communities. And so we want those students um, strengthening those muscles as well. Um, and, but we're not going to, we, we did, we just chose not to relegate that to a particular uh, domain. We really want to see that particular skill set across all seven of our, of our pathways. Excellent. This will be the final question. You talked about this program. Um, taking into consideration the fullness of the student life, academic, social, uh, athletic, um, and preparing them on engaging in a lifelong commitment to civic engagement. Any techniques or are you going to be thinking about that as you develop this curriculum on helping the students integrate mm -hmm. this without, yeah. um, I think that says they're so busy with everything else, how are we going to train and and frankly, I mean, even in an adult life, I mean, we have to look at how do we integrate our uh, commitment to public service with work, family, um, and passion. So, if you could just respond to that of how you're going to uh, help students navigate the balance. Yeah, that's a really really important question. Um, we're, we're doing that in a couple different ways. One is by encouraging students to think about themselves as a whole person. 
Um, we really want to see this as one dimension of who they are, but not a segregated bucket of things that they need to do. And that's really important because we um, want to insist that students are thinking very comprehensively about themselves, their athletic selves, their, their, the health of their body, uh, the health of their mind, uh, their spiritual health. Um, all of these are really important dimensions, and we're ampl amplifying that. For, you, you can't be a service to your community if you're yourself not healthy, right? And so self-care um, and attending to all the various dimensions of who you are is really, really important. So that's one way uh, that we're doing that. And the second is we're really encouraging students uh, to remember that there's lots of different ways for them to pursue personal growth and development. Sometimes it's just going to a single lecture, which will take an hour and a half. Sometimes it's taking an entire course, which is, you know, in hundreds of hours. Um, and that they need to make those decisions for themselves relative to their, uh, their balance of other things. There are students that are uh, engaged in all kinds of athletics. They just don't have that capacity to be able to do those things. And so they need to find more discreet ways of pursuing that development. Yeah, well, I think that's good advice for not only our students, Lewis, but advice for us on how do we navigate that wholeness um, with our individual selves and taking care of ourselves. So this has been a wonderful 45 minutes, a lot of engaging questions. Thank you so much for our very active and interactive audience. It's been a, a great program. We will have a recording of this. We will send this out um, with other information about how to stay connected um, with this program and in the future, how to become involved. But we are out of time for today with this on-air edition. But thank you so much for joining us. And wahoo wah, go hoos. Thank you all so much. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thanks, Lewis. Bye.